Today we're going to pull back the curtain on one of the most empowering corners of Rust, Smart Pointers. By the end of this video, you'll be completely comfortable with Box for heap allocation, RC for shared ownership in single-threaded code, and ARC for thread-safe shared ownership. So, what is a Smart Pointer? In Rust, a Smart Pointer is a type that behaves like a pointer, something you can dereference to get to a value, but also owns extra behavior like automatic cleanup, reference counting, or thread safety. You already met string and vector. Those are smart pointers too. Today we're going to focus on three foundational ones. The first one is box. Box is used for allocating data on the heap. Imagine you have a value that you'd rather put on the heap than on the stack. That's exactly what box of type T does. It allocates T on the heap and leaves a small pointer on the stack. Let's make that concrete. In this code, a new box named B is created and it holds the integer value 42. The asterisk B looks like C or C++, right? That's deref in action. The first print statement uses the dereference operator asterisk to explicitly access the value stored inside the box and prints it. The second print statement shows that implicit dereferencing is also at play. When you try to print a box using the standard display trait formatter, it automatically dereferences the box to get to the underlying integer as the box type implements the deref trait. This makes it convenient to use a box as if it were the value it contains without always needing to use the asterisk dereference operator. The nice thing is when B goes out of scope, Rust drops the box and frees the heap allocation automatically. To really see what's on the stack, let's check sizes. I'll print the size of I32 versus box of type I32. On a 64-bit machine, you'll typically see four bytes for I32 and eight bytes for box of type I32. That's our pointer sitting on the stack. The actual I32 lives on the heap. Moving a box moves the pointer. The heap data stays put. We can even print the addresses to see it. In this example, we can see the ownership transfer and the nature of box pointers. First, we create a box named A, which allocates the integer 99 on the heap. A raw pointer, raw A, is then created to point to the memory location of the value on the heap, and this address is printed. The key part of the code is let b equals a, which moves the ownership of the box from variable a to b. This isn't a simple copy. A is now invalid and can no longer be used. Same heap address before and after. Only the owner changed. The heap allocated data itself hasn't been moved. Only the pointer on the stack. This is confirmed by the fact that when a raw pointer, raw b, is created from b and its address is printed, it's the exact same address as raw a. Now if we try to use a, it won't compile because its ownership has been moved, while using B works as expected, printing the value 99. Where box really shines is recursive types. Rust needs to know sizes at compile time. A recursive enum like a linked list is infinitely big, unless you put recursion behind a pointer. Box gives us that indirection. Here we defined a linked list using an enum and a box. The list enum has two variants. Cons, which represents a node containing an I32 value and a pointer to the next list element, and nil, which represents the end of the list. The box of type list is crucial here because it allows the cons variant to have a recursive type of a known size at compile time, as a box is just a pointer on the stack, and the actual list data is stored on the heap. In the main function, a new list is constructed starting from the end with nil, then cons with three, then cons with two, and finally cons with one effectively creating a list 1, 2, 3, nil. The print macro with the debug formatter then prints this entire list structure in a human-readable format. Now the compiler is happy because box of type list has a known size, a pointer. Let's write a tiny length function and a push front. Here we extend the linked list enum with a len method to calculate its length and a prepend method to add a new element to the front. The prepend method takes ownership of the list, creates a new cons variant with the specified value and the old list now owned in a box and returns this new list. The len method is implemented recursively using a match expression. If the list is nil, its length is zero. If it's a cons variant, it returns one plus the length of the rest of the list, which it calculates by recursively calling len on the tail of the list. In main, an empty list is created. Prepend three adds three, prepend two adds two, and prepend one adds one to the front, creating the list one, two, three. Finally, list.len is called, which correctly returns three. Another classic box use is dynamic dispatch with trait objects. 
you might have heterogeneous values that all implement a trait. Put them in vector of type box of a dynamic draw type and call through the trait. Here's how we can implement dynamic dispatch using a trait object and a box. First, we define a draw trait that specifies a draw method, which is a common action for things that appear on a user interface. To make the UI components follow this rule, we implemented the draw trait for a button and a checkbox, each with their own unique way of being drawn to the console. In the main function, we create a vector named UI which holds a collection of trait objects, specifically a box of a dynamic draw type, which allows us to put both a button and a checkbox into the same collection. The DYN keyword signifies that the type of the value inside the box is not known at compile time, but is guaranteed to implement the draw trait. The vector is populated with a button and a checkbox, each wrapped in a box. Then, when we loop through the UI vector and call draw on each element, the program knows exactly which version of draw to use at runtime, whether it's for the button or the checkbox, showcasing a powerful concept called dynamic dispatch. You've now seen box handle heap allocation, indirection, recursive layout, and trait objects. Our second smart pointer is RC, reference counted. It is used for enabling multiple ownership of data within a single thread. Let's talk about sharing. Sometimes multiple parts of your program need to own the same data. In Rust, multiple owners normally violates the single owner rule, unless you use RC, a non-atomic, single-threaded reference counted pointer. Every clone of an RC bumps a counter. When the counter hits zero, the data is freed. Here, we created a reference counted smart pointer, which allows for multiple ownership of data on the heap. Initially, a string is created and wrapped in an RC reference counted pointer, giving it a strong reference count of one. When RC clone is called to create S1, it doesn't perform a deep copy. Instead, it's a cheap operation that simply increments the reference count to two, creating another pointer to the same data. The same thing happens inside the inner scope with S2, raising the count to three. When the inner scope ends, S2 is dropped, automatically decrementing the count back to two. Finally, the code attempts to unwrap the RC reference counted pointer to get the own string back. Because the reference count is still two due to S and S1, the try unwrap method fails as it only succeeds when the count is one, confirming that the data is still being shared. Two important things here, RC, clone, ampersand X, is the idiomatic way to make a new handle, and RC. Try unwrap lets you recover the inner value when you're the last owner. Now let's combine RC, reference counted pointer, with our linked list to allow tail sharing. First, a list is created on the heap, and its RC strong count is one. Then two new lists, B and C, are created. Instead of copying the list data, both B and C use RC, clone, to create a new RC pointer to list A. This is a cheap operation that simply increments the reference count of list A to two and then to three, respectively, allowing both B and C to share the same tail of the list. The final print statements demonstrate that both B and C can access the shared portion of the list, which starts with the elements from A. This pattern is useful for data structures like graphs, where nodes can have multiple incoming pointers. This is the persistent data structure pattern, cheap structural sharing without copies. But there's a trap. If you create cycles with RC, the reference count never hits zero and you leak memory. Let me show you the safe pattern for parent pointers in trees using weak. In this code, we are creating a tree-like data structure using a combination of RC, weak, and ref cell to manage ownership and prevent memory leaks from reference cycles. The node struct represents a node in the tree with a value, a children field that holds owning RC pointers to its children, and a parent field that holds a non-owning weak pointer back to its parent. This weak pointer is crucial. It points into the graph without owning. Ref cell allows for interior mutability, enabling us to change the parent and children fields, even when we only have an immutable reference to the node. In main, a leaf and a branch node are created. The branch becomes the owner of the leaf via RC clone, which increments the leaf's strong count. The crucial step is when we set the leaf's parent to a weak reference to the branch. This avoids a circular reference where branch owns leaf and leaf owns branch, which would cause both to never be dropped. The weak count of branch is increment. Then the weak pointer is upgraded to an RC using upgrade to temporarily access the parent's data. Upgrading gives you an option of a reference counted T. If the value is gone, you get none. Finally, when the branch is explicitly dropped, 
the weak pointer in the leaf can no longer be upgraded, proving that the branch has been deallocated, which is the desired behavior for a weak pointer. This pattern avoids RC cycles and therefore avoids leaks. The final smart pointer we are going to learn is ARC, atomic reference count. The ARC is used for enabling multiple ownership of data across multiple threads. If you try to send an RC to another thread, Rust slaps your hand. RC is not thread safe. Rust's compiler stops you, as RC isn't designed for multi-threaded use and could cause data problems. The solution is its close relative ARC, which stands for atomic reference count. ARC is built to be safe for sharing between threads because it uses atomic operations. These are special, super-fast instructions that ensure the reference count is updated correctly without any conflicts, even when multiple threads are trying to change it at the same time. This safety comes at a small cost. ARC is slightly slower than RC. Let's share read-only data across threads. No mutex needed, because we're not mutating the inner value. Here we are using an ARC, atomic reference counted, smart pointer to safely share a vector across multiple threads. First, a vector of numbers is created on the heap and wrapped in an arc. The arc is then cheaply cloned three times within a loop using arc, clone, which increments its atomic reference count without copying the underlying data. Each cloned arc is moved into a new thread using thread, spawn, giving each thread a shared, immutable reference to the same data. Each thread calculates the sum of the numbers and prints the result. After all the threads finish their work, ensured by the h.join loop, the main thread can still access the original arc, demonstrating that the data remains valid and shared among all the threads until its reference count drops to zero. Each thread gets an arc handle. They all read concurrently. Now if you want to mutate shared state, you must synchronize access. The classic pair is arc and mutex, an atomic reference counted mutex containing T. Here's a simple concurrent counter. A counter variable, an I64, is created inside a mutex for mutual exclusion and then wrapped in an arc for atomic reference counting. This combination allows the data to be safely shared among multiple threads. The code then launches eight threads. In each thread, a clone of the arc is created, providing each thread with a new owner of the counter. The loop inside each thread attempts to increment the counter 100,000 times. The c.lock.unwrap part is crucial. It acquires a lock on the mutex, ensuring that only one thread can access and modify the counter at any given moment, thus preventing race conditions. Once the lock is released, another thread can acquire it. After all threads have completed their tasks, the final value of the counter is printed, correctly showing 800,000, which is the sum of all the increments. Eight threads each increment a shared integer 100,000 times, and we end with exactly the expected total. If you tried that with only arc and no mutex, you'd have a data race. Rust wouldn't even compile it. The type system forces you to model synchronization explicitly. You can combine arc with richer structures too. Let's make a small thread pool scenario where workers share a configuration string. First, a string containing a version number is wrapped in an arc. A loop then creates four new threads. Inside the loop, arc, clone, is used to create a new, cheaply made arc pointer for each thread. This doesn't copy the data. It just increments the atomic reference count, allowing each thread to have its own pointer to the same shared string data on the heap. Each thread prints the configuration and then pauses briefly. After all the threads have finished, the main thread continues to hold its arc pointer and can still access the original configuration data. This pattern is ideal for situations where you have a read-only piece of data that needs to be shared among many parts of a multi-threaded program without the risk of data races. No locks needed since reads are immutable. Let's put it all together. Let's write one small program that shows all three smart pointers living happily together. We'll create a tiny scene graph, nodes on the heap via box, the root shared single-threaded via RC, and we'll snapshot the graph and send that snapshot index to a worker pool with ARC for read-only processing. There's a lot happening, but it's intentional. Box is simply giving us heap storage for transform. RC makes it easy to share subtrees inside one thread. ARC lets us ship a read-only snapshot to multiple threads safely. Each pointer has a clear purpose. The node and transform structs represent a scene graph, with box allocating the transform on the heap and RC, allowing a node to have multiple shared owners within a single thread. In main, first we create a simple tree-like data structure with a root node and a leaf node, using smart pointers to manage memory and ownership. 
Both nodes are wrapped in an RC. The Roots Children field is a vector containing another RC pointer. Instead of making a copy of the leaf's data, it uses RC, clone, ampersand leaf, which is a cheap operation that just increments the reference count. This means both root and the original leaf variable now share ownership of the same node data on the heap, linking the root to the leaf as its child. To enable a part of this data to be safely used in a multi-threaded context, the flatten names function creates a new, independent vector of type string containing all the node names. This new vector is then wrapped in an arc, which safely enables it to be shared across multiple threads. Each of the three threads created can then cheaply clone the arc and independently access the snapshot data without needing a mutex because the data is read-only. After the threads finish, the original RC-based structure in the main thread remains untouched and fully usable. This illustrates a common Rust pattern. Use RC for single-threaded shared ownership and ARC to safely extend that shared, immutable data to a multi-threaded context. Now let's look at two tiny experiments to sharpen your intuition. First one is confirm that box moves are cheap pointer moves. A box is a smart pointer to data on the heap, and that moving a box does not move the data itself. Here in this code, a one kilobyte array is allocated on the heap and its address is stored in the box B. The size of function correctly reports the size of the box pointer on the stack, which is only 8 bytes on a 64-bit system, and not the 1024 bytes of the data it points to. To safely observe the pointer's behavior, the manually drop wrapper is used to prevent the box from being automatically dropped, which would deallocate the heap memory. Then the box is moved from B to moved. It compares the heap addresses pointed to by address 1 from the original box and address 2 from the moved box. The addresses are identical, proving that moving a box only moves the pointer on the stack, leaving the data on the heap in place. This is a key concept of Rust's ownership system. Moves are cheap. Now let's look at the second experiment. Observe the cost model of RC versus ARC. We'll just clone them a bunch of times to see they behave the same from an API perspective. ARC does the same work with Atomics under the hood. In this code, we can see the core difference between RC and ARC smart pointers. The RC is used for reference counting in a single-threaded context, while ARC is used for atomic reference counting for multi-threaded scenarios. Both are used to create multiple owners of data on the heap. We create an RC and an ARC, each holding the value 5. When RC clone is called, it increments a simple, non-thread-safe counter, and RC strong count can publicly report this count, which is 2 after 1 clone. In contrast, ARC clone uses a special, thread-safe, atomic, counter to handle multi-threaded access. Rust's standard library doesn't provide a public method like RC strong count for ARC because exposing a non-atomic read could introduce a data race, a risk that the ARC type is specifically designed to prevent. So, while we can see the cloned ARC 2 still holds the value 5, we can't get a public strong count from the ARC smart pointer, which highlights ARC's design philosophy of prioritizing thread safety above all else. A few reminders as we wrap. Avoid cycles. When using RC to share data, you can accidentally create a loop where objects point to each other, preventing them from being cleaned up. Use weak pointers to break these loops and avoid memory leaks. Single thread versus multi-thread. Use RC for sharing data only within one thread. If you need to share data between multiple threads, the compiler will stop you. In that case, you should use ARC, which is built for thread-safe sharing. Immutable versus mutable. By default, RC and ARC give you shared but immutable access. To change the data they point to, you need to combine them with a type that allows for interior mutability, like ref cell for single-threaded code or mutex for multi-threaded code. All right, that's a full tour of box, RC, and ARC with real code to make the mental model click. You've seen heap allocation and indirection with box, shared ownership in single-threaded code with RC, and thread-safe sharing with ARC. If this clarified how Rust lets you express rich ownership patterns without losing safety, drop a comment with your favorite example from today and tell me what you have built with these tools.